I was doing some reading, and I ran across that phrase, have you not read? And Jesus said that phrase many times. And so I was thinking, well, you know, I got to look at how many times did he say it and all those things. And he said it quite a few times, and, and we're going to go through those over the next uh, few weeks. Um, I had thought about doing them all in one Sunday. The more I looked at it, I was like, no, I can't, I can't fit them all in one Sunday because then I felt like I'd be rushing it. And I felt like there was a lot of important lessons there, but they all go back to the Scripture. Because each time Jesus said, have you not read? And the point he was making is that uh, it, it was kind of a rhetorical question because he already knew the answer to it. He knew that they had read it because he was talking, most of the time he was talking to religious leaders. Uh, and so this was something that obviously whatever he was being challenged on, uh, and he brought it out to them that it was something that they had obviously read but didn't comprehend or didn't understand uh, because of things that they were doing. And I feel like at times, you know, we, we do the same thing. And so I, you know, I was thinking about, you know, when you look at how the Scriptures shape their life, you know, the Scripture should be shaping our life as well. And so when Jesus, when you come across this and Jesus says, have you not read? Um, I ask you the same question, have you not read? Are you comprehending what the Scripture is saying about you and how you should be living your life? And so what Jesus did, Jesus always went back to Scripture. And so whenever we're challenged in life, which we will be, we, we're always challenged in life, no matter how good we may have it or how bad we have it or anywhere in between, we always are challenged. And so Scripture is the best place to go to be able to get that, to be able to go, uh, go to, to Jesus and just ask Him you know, these questions about how we should do things. And so this morning, um, this is the title for each week. Um, so part one, obviously, today. Um, but if you want to turn with me to Matthew chapter 12, that's where we're going to begin this morning in this, this series of how the Scripture shapes our life. Matthew chapter 12. And we're going to look at the, these eight verses. And there's a lot in these eight verses. Now, as we pick up here, this is, um, as you read Matthew, when, when Matthew wrote, Matthew wasn't, uh, he didn't write his gospel in a chronological order. Uh, so if you go and start looking at, th and looking at the events that happened in Matthew in, a chron in chronological order, you'll realize that uh, his gospel is not. Uh, but the way that Matthew wrote his gospel was in uh, topical form. So uh, certain topics, he would put them all in one bunch, uh, whether they were chronological or not. And so he's, he's dealing uh, with this, um, this uh, portion of the law, how, how the Pharisees and Jesus, how they had these interactions with the law. And so this is, these are in the early stages of this, but this is not the first time that Jesus had been challenged thus far, uh, but this is where we're going to pick up today. Uh, but he's dealing with the Sabbath. And, uh, of course, the Sabbath is important, isn't it? Um, you know, of course, the Sabbath for the Jews was on Saturday. Uh, and as Christians started meeting uh, in the first century, they started meeting on Sunday because of uh, the risen Christ. He rose on Sunday, so they started meeting in that form. Then Christians picked it up, and uh, we all started worshiping on Sunday. So, you know, that's kind of, kind of how we take our Sabbath. But um, I really believe that a Sabbath is any day of the week that you can take one day of rest because everybody needs a day of rest. Your body can't, can't just function that way. Um, but the Sabbath was very important to the Jews. It was uh, obviously uh, is one of the Ten Commandments. Uh, it is the longest of the Ten Commandments in, form, in terms of word form uh, about how we should be keeping the Sabbath and honoring the Sabbath. And it was one of the three things that the Jews, the, the three main things 
that the Jews focused on in their everyday life was the Sabbath. So uh, needless to say, it was of high importance in everyday Jewish life. And so, of course, you know, Jesus was, was there when uh, the Ten Commandments were handed out. And so Jesus was a part of that. They're part of his words as well. So they would be important to Jesus, right? Yes, they would. But now Jesus is being challenged by the religious leaders on the Sabbath. So we'll begin with verse 1. It says, At that time Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. So let's talk about a little bit about the Sabbath and some of the things that they were, it was uh, unlawful to do. Number one, it was unlawful to travel on the Sabbath. And these are just a few examples, but there's a lot. Um, travel was forbidden on the Sabbath. And it wasn't the point that people were traveling. It was the point that the Pharisees had made um, extra rules regarding that. They were kind of coloring outside the lines, if you will. And so they were imposing those on the people. And so when they, whenever they would travel, they, would, they started figuring out loopholes so that they could travel farther. So it sounds like a bunch of lawyers, don't it? Well, it was a thousand yards was what they could travel uh, legally on the Sabbath. Well, they started figuring out different ways to get around this. So one of the things is, uh, about if, if, if there was a road and there was a rope at the end of the road, then, then that whole area was considered your residence. So if the, you know, the end of the road's way down there, so you could actually travel farther than a thousand yards in order to get to that rope. But then at the end of that rope, that was the end of your residence or, or, or where you lived. Then you could go legally a thousand yards beyond that. Now, if somebody was really smart, what they would do then is that they would place some food the day prior, over in a, a thousand yards away. Now, what that would do is that they considered that wherever there was food stored, then that was considered a temporary home or a temporary place of residence. So then they could travel that distance, then go that thousand distance, and then say, oh, we've got food here. This is another residence, so now I can travel another thousand. You see how they were coloring outside the lines. And so they were imposing strict rules on travel. Another thing that was uh, forbidden on the Sabbath was carrying a load. Now just, uh, you know, if you start thinking about it, there's a million things that might be considered a load. Well, let's, let's just see how ridiculous they, they got with this. Is they considered um, carrying clothes. If you were in your home and you carried clothes uh, from one room to another... That was considered work. That was considered carrying a load. And so that was forbidden. So how did you get around that? Well, if you're in this room and you wanted to take a jacket into that room, you couldn't carry it. You had to put it on, walk it over there, and then take it off. At that point, it wasn't considered carrying a load. So you see how these, these people were getting ridiculous with coloring outside the lines of the law. And then, here's another one. Of course, the law forbid certain types of work. And now, this one, this one floored me. I'd never heard this one before, but it was pretty funny um, and, and ridiculous at the same time. If a Jew was walking on the Sabbath and they chose to spit on the ground. Now, if they spit in the dirt and it made an indention in the dirt, then it was considered plowing. And it was considered work. <laughs> now, if they spit on a rock, it was not considered work. So you can tell there were some people really brainstorming about these things. Should have carried a cup, right? <laughs> 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 see, there we go. <laughs> now, yeah. Now, see, here's the thing. The law was given to be a benefit to the people, not to be a burden 
And that was something that Jesus taught regularly. That was something that he would constantly argue with the Pharisees about. That was his big gripe with them is that they were overcomplicating the law and that they were adding things that were not there because all of these things, they were laws, but the things that I just told you about, those ridiculous things, those were things that they added over time and they became more of oral traditions. And so those are the things that Jesus and them constantly battled about because they considered them law, but Jesus like, no, look, you're overburdening people. And I think that's what we do at church sometimes. I think we overburden people with trying to make it too complicated. Have you ever felt like church was complicated at times? You know, about what you need to wear, what type of music's playing. You know, if you've ever been to a business meeting, you know how that can, that can go. We just complicate things, don't we? And so, in all these things, Jesus tells us, you know, have you not read? Have you, do you not understand what, what the Scripture says? Do you not understand what the law is for? The law is meant to help you in your walk with me. And that's what the Scripture is for, is to help us in our everyday walk with Him. And, and it's to help us shape our life in a positive and better way, a way that's fit for eternity. And that's what Jesus was trying to teach his disciples, but also teach these Pharisees who should have known better. So the Pharisees, they had figured out, they had created 39 categories of work that was prohibited. And so as we go along here, now, Jesus walking through a grain field was not uncommon. Now, he, you know, I think we like to picture just him just walking through some random grain field. But the truth is, is that grain fields in that day, they, were, they had to have boundaries. They had to have borders, and so normally they were lined with rocks. But it was not uncommon for roads to go right through somebody's grain field. And so more than likely, Jesus and his disciples were walking down the road going to another town uh, so that Jesus could preach the gospel there. And so his disciples are coming through, and they're hungry. Well, sometimes when you walk, you get hungry, right? So here's Jesus and his disciples, they're walking. And the Pharisees, they said, they saw this, and they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is lawful on the Sabbath. Now, number one here, I want to say, what were the Pharisees doing out there? Well, that's a good, that's a good observation. But how far did they walk to get from their place of uh, where they should have been to where Jesus was? I about bet you it was more than a thousand yards. And I bet they used one of them loopholes. But see, they, they did these things in order to get at Jesus. See, they were being legalistic, which is what we do a lot of times in church. We try to be legalistic. And that's what they were doing with Jesus here. They were griping about something that they themselves were breaking. But that wasn't their big gripe. Because I think that they knew that they were hypocrites here because they were out there. The big rub that they had about the work that was being committed was the reaping because the disciples went through and, and grabbed some handfuls of grain as they were walking. That doesn't seem like a big deal, does it? Does that seem like work to you? It is not. It doesn't seem like work. Well, there's several things here that happened. Number one, they considered what the disciples were doing was picking grain. Now, that in itself was not illegal according to the law. Uh, people were supposed to leave certain amounts of grain for those who walked by, strangers, uh, the poor, whoever could come by and get some if they were hungry. So they weren't breaking the law by doing that. So they were going by and just picking up as they went along, getting that. Now, to the Pharisees, they said, well, that's work. That's considered reaping. So they were griped about that. And then they said, the second thing is that in order to get to the wheat, they had to rub it in their hands. And so they were rubbing it in their hands. And so at this point, they were guilty of threshing because that's the process in which you get to the grain. But then they didn't stop there. There was something else the disciples were guilty of, according to the Pharisees. They were considered guilty of winnowing, which was blowing you know, this is what the wind normally did whenever you went to the threshing floor and you were separating the wheat from the shaft. You would let the wind do the work. 
Well, because they were blowing away and separating the chaff, that was considered winnowing. So now we've got, they're guilty of reaping, they're guilty of threshing, and they're guilty of winnowing. And then, when you add them all together, what did they do with their, their work? They ate it. Well, put them all together, now they were guilty of eating a meal on the Sabbath. At this point, when they did this, in verse 3, Jesus answered, He answered, Haven't you read? Okay, so here's Jesus going back to the Scriptures. Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do but only for the priests. All right, so Jesus poses a question to them. And he goes back to an instance, or what we were talking about maybe last week. He was talking about precedence. Okay, here's some precedence. Now, here's David, a revered figure in Old Testament lore and history. All right, so they, they, they held David because, you know, they, they knew what the Scripture said about David. So he, you know, he's taking it back and said, well, have you not read what happened in this instance? You know this story very well. Did you really read it? Did you understand it? Did you comprehend it? Well, obviously they didn't because it was shaping their life in a negative way and not in a positive way. Because if they would have looked at it, if they would have comprehended it, they would have understood the whole story. So what happened was, if you go back to 1 Samuel chapter 20 there toward the end, it paints the picture of why David was there. David was fleeing from Saul. Saul was trying to kill him. David had already been anointed as king, uh, the next king of Israel. And so Saul had this rub with him, and so he was trying to kill David. David was running. David was fleeing. And he, he left in such a hurry that he had no weapons, he had no food, he had nothing. He just took himself. And so he ended up at this, this, uh, this, this, this temple or, or, or the tabernacle, wherever he was at, and there was these priests who were in there working because that was their job. And so he went in. The priest knew who he was. And he said, I'm hungry. I have no provisions. Now, they were right in that it was against the law for anybody other than the priest to eat this bread because that bread had been prepared as a consecration for the Lord. There was always to be bread inside the tabernacle. The bread of life. And that was to show this communion with God. So here Jesus poses this question. What was right here? Here's someone who was starving. Someone who had fled and had no food. You know, it wasn't like a grocery store. You can't just go around every corner and just get food. It's a lot harder to come by. So here's this food. Now, there's part of this story here that if you go back and read 1 Samuel chapter 20 and, and, and chapter 21, it tells us that the priest said, well, all we have is the bread that we just took off, not the fresh bread that we made. He said, that's all we have. And David said, that's fine. Let me have that. Now, even though it was unlawful, technically, for him to eat that, if they had tried to color outside the lines like the Pharisees were doing, what would they have done? They would have sent a man away hungry. How do you think God would have felt about that? Because if you read in his law, that was part of the law, was taking care of the needy and the hungry, no matter who they were. How often do we hold the letter of the law and we forget about mercy and we forget about those things about taking care of the poor and the needy? I think the church has really, really forgotten this thing. I mean, you, you can tell me if I'm wrong and I don't think I am. You know, we talk about saving money, saving money, saving money. That's not the church's job. The church's job is to be giving money and giving it to people who need it. A giving church 
is a blessed church, and I've never seen a giving church be broke, ever. And so there's some lessons here. How does it shape our own life, but how does it shape the church's life? Have we not read? So there was a challenge here about what to do with the needy when it comes. And so the priest gave the bread. Now obviously, Jesus held that in high esteem. Used it as an example, obviously. The other thing that Jesus here said here in verse 5, he said, again, he asked this question, or haven't you read in the law that the priests on Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath and yet are innocent? So what he's talking about here is if you understand the function of a priest on Sabbath day, they're busy. The entire time, they're working the entire time. They carry loads the entire time. Everything that the Pharisees said could not be done on the Sabbath. Every single one of them who performed in the temple did just that. So Jesus brought that to their attention. Because they constantly had to keep the incense burning. They constantly had to be making bread and keeping it on the table. They constantly had to be making sacrifices And all these things had to be done on the Sabbath. So Jesus is explaining that there's things that can be done on the Sabbath. But it was their perception. It was how they read Scripture that was shaping their life and and, and how they lived. You know, there's, there's, there's groups today who they take Scripture... And Jesus, and we could ask Him the same thing, have you not read? Because they take and they pervert the Scriptures. They add their own thing to it. I've heard so many examples about how churches have have done things to people and then people leave the church and never come back. It's because we're, we're, we're so worried about some of these traditions. We're so worried about some of these things that paint outside the lines that we forget about why we're here. And it's about taking care of each other, loving each other, feeding each other if that's necessary. Those are the things that Jesus commanded in His law. Those were the things, as we talked about uh, last week, where uh, Jesus summed it up. He summed up the entire law about loving God with all that you are and loving your neighbor as yourself. That was the law. There was other laws, yes, but that was the law. There was mercy and grace built into the law. So Jesus, He was telling them that, hey, the law is meant for your benefit not to hinder your relationship with Him. How many people come to church and just say, man, all these rules and regulations, it's just, I can't find my way to God. We need to quit overcomplicating things and just go back to the basics. Have we not read? What, is, what do the Scriptures say? And how can they shape my life? The other thing here that Jesus said in this, as He brought this up, He says, you condemned the innocent. So in saying, He's saying, you accused my disciples of doing something wrong in which they were not wrong. How many times do we accuse people? We gripe about people because they ain't wearing the right clothes. Thank God they're in church. And if they don't have good clothes, if they come in rags, filthy rags, whose job is it to help them? Ours. Somebody comes in and they're hungry. Whose job is it? Ours. So we have a responsibility. But see, we get so tied up in traditions and this and that and the other. That's not why we're here. How is it shaping our life? It should be how is it shaping our relationship with Jesus Christ? 
You know, I, I hear, you know, churches, somebody comes in with tattoos. You're not welcome here. Such a dumb thing. A good friend of mine was run out of a church. He was trying to change his life. He was trying to turn his life around. And the church that he was attending, they constantly berated him for his tattoos. And guess what? He left the church. And he never stepped foot in one again. Who cares? He's coming to church. See, this next verse, Jesus gets down to the nitty-gritty here. When we think about these things and we overcomplicate church and, and we're making all, these, uh, all these, these statutes and things that don't matter, what I call as trivial matters, we need to get down to the, the foundations, get down to the basics, and get to the salvation matters. Those are the things that matter. We can all disagree about certain things, but we need to be on page and on point about the salvation matters. And that's what Jesus was getting to. In verse 6, He says this, I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. He was talking about Himself. He said, I'm here. Something greater than these, these outside the, uh, the, the, the line drawing rules that you got. He said, I'm here to make your life better. And that's what we ought to be telling people when they come to church is that we're here to, make, we're here to tell you how to make your life better, not by imposing more rules on you. Because you can read what the rules are because we're uh, Christian people are a people of do's and don'ts, right? There's certain things we can do and certain things we can't do. So we're people of do's and don'ts. So we can learn that. We can learn what to do and what not to do. What's acceptable as a Christian and what's not. But we've got to get on board with why we're here. Jesus. That's why we're here. And then he said this, and he goes back to the Old Testament. See, how many times has he gone back to the Old Testament already? In just a short amount. He's gone back a lot. So you see how much just in eight verses Jesus is referring back to the Scripture. How many times in your life when you have a problem, how often do you go back to the Scripture? Or do you call a friend and say, Hey, what do you think I ought to do? I don't know. <laughs> there you go we're supposed to go to the well that never runs dry and that's Jesus from verse 7 he says this if you had known what these words mean I desire mercy not sacrifice you would have not condemned the innocent. See, Jesus is not saying that the law is to be thrown out. It's not what he's saying at all. He's never said that. Jesus followed the law. But there's grace and mercy built into the law, and that's what they never recognized. How often do we not recognize where we should be showing humility and mercy and grace to other people? How many times have church split because people bicker back and forth with one another? Because they're not showing humility. They're not showing mercy with one another. And to be honest, we've all been guilty of that at some point. We've all been in, uh, at a place at some point in our life where we've not shown mercy to somebody else. We've not been forgiving to someone else. People hold grudges in churches. And that drives me up the wall. How can you be a Christian and hold a grudge? Stop it. Just get over it. But he said, if you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. 
See, within the, within the confines of the law, those things are built in. And, and those, when we read this, that we ought to know that. And those are the things that ought to be shaping our life for the better in our walk with him in our walk to eternity. And then he breaks it down and he ends it with this, verse 8, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So he's, he's just simply telling them, the law is for your benefit. I made this for you. He gave the law to us for our benefit. See, when we go outside the lines and we start making these arbitrary rules and regulations and traditions, we only think things harder for ourselves. Instead of just following Him and emulating Him. That's what He wants us to do. That's how He wants us to shape our life. Is by looking at this, asking Him, Lord, help me understand this so that I can live for you. So this week, if you feel like it, read through the Bible and, and see how many times in the book of Matthew you can find the, uh, the term, have you not read? Because that's what we'll be talking about the next several weeks. That's what I challenge you with today. How is the scripture shaping your life? Think about that. Let's stand for our closing prayer. Heavenly Father, today as we, we think about how the Scripture shapes our life and, and, and how we carry about everyday business, Lord, um, um, being a Christian is not easy. Uh, I don't think you ever said that. Uh, I think if we honestly read the Scriptures, we know that. But Lord, we know that we can get through things. Lord, as, as Brenda was talking about a while ago, whenever she's thinking about sorrowful things or, or thinking about things that bring her pain, Lord, she turns to you and prays. And Lord, that, those are the things that, that we should be doing. Or even in the tough times of, of being able to call out to you, being able to uh, read your word and just have you speak to us. Just that sweet whisper, Lord, that you give to us every time, Lord, that we pick up the scriptures. Even if we don't fully, fully understand it, Lord, if we open our hearts and minds to you, Lord, you speak to us. Lord, and you help us, you encourage us, you give us a pep talk. That, you, that we can do it with your strength. Father, when we are weak, you are strong. So Lord, as we go through our trials in life, and we all do, we've all experienced pain and suffering in this life and even in this past year. Father, we just we ask that, Lord, as we dig into your scripture, Lord, that that strengthening, that nourishing, Lord, that we would open ourselves up, Lord, and you would pour it into us, Lord, that we would make that effort to understand your scripture, to understand that word of hope, Lord, and that it would shape our life for the better. Lord, I thank you for this word, this reminder. Lord, I pray as we continue in this series, Lord, you would enlighten all of us, Lord, to the things that we can do to improve our lives and our relationship with you and to shape our lives. Lord, I pray for everyone here. Lord, uh, uh, Thanksgiving is this, this week, and as we celebrate it with our friends and family, Lord, just let us not forget why we're giving thanks and why we should be doing it every day and not just on Thursday. Lord, I pray for everyone here. I hope they have a blessed week. I hope that you bring everybody back here to the next appointed hour. Lord, we pray all of these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.